Hello, my name is Chris Thurston and welcome to the second in our series of chats with game developers at Rezd. In this one, I talk to Robert Kurvitz, who is the lead designer and writer of Disco Elysium, formerly called No Truce with the Furies, which was easily, I think, the most uh, surprising and impressive game I played at Rezd this year, and I don't think I'm alone in feeling that way. To give you some context that might help with this uh, chat that you're about to listen to, Disco Elysium is a role-playing game where you play as a amnesiac detective waking up after a traumatic three-day bender uh, with no memory of who they are in a uh, fictional world, but one that kind of reflects some of the uh, aesthetics and, and political pressures of the 1970s, sort of. Uh, it's very much its own thing. The reason it was so impressive to me is that even though there are things about this setup that are... You might have seen another fiction, The Alcoholic Detective, etc. The game struck me because of its uh, humanity and its sense of empathy, which is mostly expressed through extremely detailed writing, depicting the interior life of the character who you're playing, but also sort of forming through your conversations with other people. Uh, it's unafraid to get into the political weeds um, a little bit, as is its creator, as you'll find. And uh, that sense of empathy and the kind of deliberate uh, series of decisions about who that character is and how they relate to the people around them that you get to make, but that the game developers have also thought about and laid out for you in order to create a much more kind of uh, intensely uh, self-aware sense of a person's role in their society is what really impressed me about at least the first hour of the game that I got to play at Rezd. And hopefully some of the things we're about to talk about from why games are written the way they are to how this Estonian art collective came to become game developers were kind of an interesting framing uh, for some of those ideas. One thing I would say is we do have possibly some plot spoilers and probably definitely some thematic spoilers for Disco Elysium in the course of this conversation. Uh, the way I would describe it is think about playing uh, Planescape Torment if you already knew the answer to the question, what can change the nature of a man? We actually get to the point of maybe answering that, que that uh, an equivalent question for Disco Elysium in the course of this conversation. So if you want to play the game completely unspoiled, I would actually probably recommend waiting for it to come out, playing it, and then maybe listening to this conversation. Uh, how, but, I personally, as someone who hasn't played the full game, um, doesn't know what it fully contains. Now that I know certain things about where it's going, I'm actually more excited to play it. So yeah, I thought I'd give a little bit of a heads up about that at the beginning of this uh, 30 minute chat. Um, but I hope you enjoy it either way. I hope you find it interesting. I think Robert's a really interesting uh, writer and certainly an outspoken you know, thinker about what games can do and, and what they can, the kinds of stories they can tell. Uh, have fun. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's, I, I wasn't sure how to introduce this, and that's probably done it. I'm here with Robert from the Disco Elysium team. Uh, you are the lead designer and writer and CEO, and explain explain yourself. As a CEO, so, CEO is such a douchebag thing to say. We, we share the responsibility. Uh, but I'm, uh, I'm the... I'm gonna, I think I'm going to say, I think I'm going to do an ego attack. Go for it. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start the end titles of the game by saying, written and designed by Robert Kurwitz. Right. Yeah, I'm going to future protect myself against IP battles against my colleagues now. And just <laughs> would you, would you not be tempted to go for the, like, Sid Meier kind of thing? Like, oh, where you put your name on the title of the game? On the title? That's, that would be, that, that Robert Corbett's yes. Disco Elysium. Elysium. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have a ring to me. <laughs> <laughs> but you just had a rename. You, you know, that was probably your opportunity, right? Yeah, yeah, like, just to call it myself. Yeah, I kind <laughs> exactly. of lost it there, yeah. yeah. But most of most of what you do as a, as a lead is you try to make it not your thing. Right. So your main yeah. goal is to make it everyone else's thing and then to accommodate them. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, you know, do your job, which is to uh, keep a unified kind of aesthetic and and, and design co course to it. So yeah, it's, I, I don't know how Sid Meier did it, <laughs> how he got those guys aboard, but. Uh, yeah, that's not how we wrote. <laughs> so tell me a bit about your, your background, because I know that you've kind of, like, I think one of the things that's a hallmark of your game, and I think something that's very, the strength of it is that it comes from a position outside maybe of game industry, kind of normal patterns and practices. And Yeah, we're a very strange story um, um, that I hope someone one day is going to tell in cinematic format, no. <laughs> but um, uh, we were first... Uh, cultural movement, mm. and then I still consider us a cultural movement. Mm. Uh, but a cultural movement with equally highbrow 
some would say pretentious. I think the online slang is pretentious. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, continental intellectualism was also used quite a while ago. Uh, but at the same time, we are we're nerds. Like I, I was a nerd when it was cool to be one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, before then, the dark times. Yeah, before the dark times <laughs> happened. Uh, and then I'm a, I'm a high school dropout and the, and, and the nerd who's been building this uh, uh, f- fantastic realist setting for my entire adult uh, mm. life. Um, but in the meanwhile, I also, or we also managed to uh, compile a motley crew of artists and, and uh, business people and, and uh, left-wing people mm. and and, uh, and just uh, harv- do a kind of talent harvest and cut them together and then then we kind of collectively discovered that uh, culture is dead, films are dead, books are dead, nothing yeah. moves, you know, it's like molasses, like nothing, you can't get the word out and we're stuck in a little country in Eastern Europe and then we thought Fuck it, let's let's make a really really expensive crazy video. <laughs> and we, it, it was a mir- it is a miracle of funding that we got it privately funded. Mm. Think about it. And I think we were helped by uh, Pillars of Eternity and the Kickstarter successes for yeah. for hardcore isometric RPGs. And yeah, then we started making this one. And it turns out if you take all the abilities of an arti- of a classic like artist movement, whether it's like writers, like Tata stuff, like you have writers, artists, and so on. Uh, we had trouble getting programmers in it, but yeah. <laughs> there are also really, really cool programmers out yeah, there. They're thinking people, and then they fit really well into this moment. And then, yeah, then we incorporated and became mega happies, and then uh, here we are. Yeah, it's fascinating because I've maybe noticed this pattern: like, games are not themselves a progressive movement inherently, right? This is also a part of culture that is stuck in some of its own ways, and then has some of the same issues as the other mediums you describe. But it does. There is there is a a recurring exception, and that makes me question the rule. If that makes sense, like good good stuff gets funded in the games industry, which is a kind of strange, program. miraculous sometimes. Yeah. Yes, I mean good stuff gets funded and uh, and dragged from season to season when it's at a loss in the TV industry too. True. Sure. Yeah. Um, and even better, I think so. Even better in the TV industry, but then then second best, I say, games are the second liveliest cultural endeavor on the planet mm. after the TV swindle, which I'm not interested in because I don't want to be a scriptwriter. Right. I, I want I want our writers want to be the stars of the show. They want to yeah, be yeah. the you know not somewhere tucked away in Hollywood. Uh, and then after that, everything else is just everything else is just wasteland. Like everything is dying, and uh, and it's a bit because games are doing this well. Also, mm-hmm. games are eating up a lot of talent right now from like writers and that, especially artists, especially yeah. craftsmen, modelers. Sculpture has ceased to exist. Yet we have three D right. modeling everywhere. So yeah, I mean, games can be tremendously wonderful, but it's it's discouraging the heart to start. Yeah, it's interesting. I've always thought of game development is an, it's an inherently collective form, right? It requires, it's multidisciplinary by, by its nature, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously people can make games for themselves, mm-hmm. but to produce something like you're producing really like the vast majority of games require a team working together. I've traditionally thought of that in terms of like software companies development, but actually the art collective model is actually not a terrible fit for, for games. Mm-hmm. I, feel, I think, mm, well, video games are are like a composite art piece. Yeah. They're like a gesamtkunstwerk, like like the opera was one of the first ones where you yeah. could have like set decoration, words, poetry, music. Uh, I think the second greatest that that just buried opera forever was cinema. Yeah, and and I think it's a good sign of a medium if it if it can accommodate more talent in it yeah. than the previous gesamtkunstwerk. And games are games can accommodate much more human uh, ability than even films. Yeah, like you can put even more into games, and then this is why I'm I'm this is this is why it's just I to me it's just mathematical, it's just probability that that games will overtake films because you can put more good stuff in them. They right. accommodate more. Yeah, and that and so it's also what what we're trying to do in many ways. Like we have four or five departments, and everyone needs to be great if if the if the VO fucks up, yeah. it makes the text sound bad. And you, you've played the beginning of the mm-hmm. game, right? Imagine if it wasn't a good VO who reads yeah. that line still. It would be pretentious and fall apart. 
and at the art and everything, art especially is a, is a sink or swim thing. Like if our game didn't look pretty colorful as it yes, does, and yes. nice, we put everything we can, like commercial in it. Yes. We've really, really tried to make That's it eye catching. That's yeah. interesting. So you need to be armed to the teeth with talent. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about, I guess, the origins of Disco I mean, it wasn't always called that, but like why this project, right? When you have that, you suddenly have that impetus, like we are going to spend a lot of money making a video game. Why this video game? Uh, well, it's most natural for us to do a, do a role-playing game. Right. I, because we're really ambitious people, and I think the, I think the RPG is, is it kind of like a, is 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 the is the the crown genre of all video mm. games. It's it it most it, it's most straight up the childhood dream of video games, like life simulator. Yes, right. And it requires a lot of different talents in it. So we wanted to like we wanted to go for for the most for what we think is the most important thing for the industry. And I think. RPGs are the battleground for creativity and then mm. just even defining what an RPG is a massive battle in the industry. Everyone yeah. wants to put that tag there and I mean I personally don't think that Diablo is an RPG. You know, you don't, it's something else, like it, you don't play a role there or something. I mean well I suppose the, the defining kind of split is almost like the simulationist side of things. There's sort of Elder Scrolls, mm -hmm. uh, the mango rolls down a hill and knocks a cart over and mm -hmm. the cart falls on a dragon. That's a form mm -hmm. of role playing, just I don't mm -hmm. know whose job that actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and then what you were doing, which is um, writing led, uh, you know, or, or sort of, I would say, I know there are lots of authors and lots of creative people, but it feels authored in a way that a simulation RPG does not. I, it, for To have a good story, it needs to be offered. Like, yeah. I think offered is just a. Just a just a quality badge on something. Yes. Uh, and then the fact that um, these um, uh, rolling barrel against dragon simulators oh, don't seem offered uh, is just a problem that they have on the writing team. Yeah. They, they, and then the, it's an understandable problem. I wouldn't. I wouldn't want that job because it needs so much writing. Um, but they definitely would need more writers, and they would need like at least two or four real control people working on it. Uh, but it wouldn't hurt if it would be a four-year too. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I, I don't, and, and at the same time, it wouldn't hurt us if you could roll a barrel down a hill in our game, <laughs> like not hitting a dragon, but maybe hitting a car or something. <laughs> That's an interesting, an interesting question, though. So we're in a very loud room, so we have to occasionally. It's the loudest on Earth. It's the loudest <laughs> floor on planet Earth. It's incredible. <laughs> But, well, I guess what I would say is, like, so, you know, uh, for me, playing the game yesterday, a huge strength of the Disco Elysium is the degree of uh, attention to detail in the writing. And the, 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 uh, the attention to the small details of existing, really, is kind of the thing that you were doing, I would say, that no one has have seen do to the same extent. I would argue maybe Ties of Numenera is a game that has some similar interests, but a very, very different approach. Um, and as soon as you get into the territory of systemic design, surely it will become much harder to have a authored experience to that degree of detail and quality and not be in totally in control of your environment. Of course, I mean, even there's even a. I mean, when you look at Bethesda games, for example, yeah. um, they sometimes release DLCs where they show that they can do a great deep story. Yeah. Like it's possible. But that's not what they're going for. They're going for. A, they're going for something you can do in any sequence of events in their mm. open world. And then for that to work, uh, it needs to be uh, shallow in a way, mm. so, that you d so that you don't get logical inconsistencies from going from one place to another. You can go from one place and become a dragon king and then meet the beggar and you can't tell the beggar that, hey, I'm the dragon king, maybe it's yeah, my yeah. fault that you're a beggar. Yeah. But with what we're doing, we, that needs to happen. Mm. Uh, it's, it's very frustrating mm. and, and expensive to, to, to get it to that level in RPG mm. too, but it's possible if you if you limit the scope a bit and then and, and if you if you if you kind of zoom in on a more realistic kind of um, well yeah I guess you could say we really are concerned with trying to sim simulate what it's like to be a thinking entity yeah that's that's I think the thing right it's almost like the sort of first principles at the beginning of the game I and mean, that's a perfect example right like, you know you, have the audacity to start with a black screen and someone's kind of like uh, having an argument with the deepest parts of themselves about whether or not they even really want to be is at all. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Um, if you, you know, it's like that, um, 
if you want to make an apple pie from scratch, you have to invent the universe kind of yeah. thing. And it's it's. Uh, I was always I was intrigued with the concept of a of an ancient reptilian brain that, yeah. that gives us the light disarm feeling. Mm. You know, that provides us with the most basic kind of like uh, here here I am. <laughs> yeah. What is the axiomatic kind of basis? Yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, and then uh, since our game also has a, it has a. A male protagonist, yeah, uh, and who's very specific, but mm. whom you get to approach as a carte blanche kind of thing. So yeah. you, you get to, uh, you know, you get to make this guy, uh, this forty something moribund alcoholic, into like a you know feminist or a fascist or a you know very athletic guy or a, or a very intellectual guy and so yeah. on. But we needed there to be a kind of uh, iconic central character to write. A story that's even in any way good, you kind of have to have that. So, my first idea was okay, so what if a girl is playing this character? Yeah. Okay, so what if someone who's black is playing this character? Uh, because we want to make it so personal for you. You know, yeah. uh, that even being happening to be in a in a white skin, fair skin body is is it's a thing in the game. Yes, it, it, it's 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 not people just don't. It's not like no one mentions it. Then it doesn't mm. come up. Uh, so. I, I thought I need to start from a more basic level of, of existence to kind yes. of sell the immersion into the character from that. And I think we've achieved a really immersive beginning with that. But it could have just been absolute garbage, like, <laughs> could have been stupid. Uh, but it has beautiful music too. British Sea Power has this, the song is called Tiger King. It's just very, it's actually very, it wouldn't work at all without the music. So, so yeah, this, this, Strangely enough, it turns out that everyone has fought this way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In this kind of black abyss of like, man, this is so nice. Maybe I could go further into not existing anymore. <laughs> well, I think this is really interesting. So I wanted to talk to you about was the formation of tequila as a lead character because I felt like um, you had you have succeeded, but in quite dangerous territory from a storytelling point of view. Mm -hmm. Because there are plenty of stories, there are plenty of sort of modern noir stories, or, or your equivalent about deadbeat alcoholic mm -hmm. detectives. You know, it is a trope in its own right. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes be extremely uncritically done. It can be done in the sense that, like, oh, look how look how difficult it is to be a white guy who's also a police uh, officer. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you know, I you're entering the territory and you're succeeding, but it's interesting that you succeeded. I heard a lot of people be uh, like uh, be wary of it when we came up. Yeah. Um, strangely enough, it never works so that uh, uh, you know the progressive like uh, nice girl gamers are like. Uh, you know, uh, afraid that it's going to be one of those like uh, true detective macho fuck off very series where every second character has child sexual molestation as their background story. Yeah. You know, like the fucking dirty tricks that American storytellers like. Yes. Do. Like, uh, and you know, the Nazis really dig your shit. They're like, yeah, oh, this is the greatest. Now the Nazis yeah. don't hear it. <laughs> the fascists haven't even heard of your shit. They're playing like Kingdom Come, Come Deliverance and killing gay people or whatever you can do in that game. And, and, and all you get is like. You know, uh, girl gamers thinking like, man, this is gonna suck. Uh, but I, I, you do need to put yourself into, like, as a writer, especially in our day and age, of like constant culture war. Yeah. You need to put yourself in the most vulnerable, fucked up position that you can humanly put yourself in. Yeah. And then you have to write yourself out of it, like piece by piece, and prove that no, you know, I can handle this. So mm. there are definitely moments in the game later on that are just extreme examples of that, and a lot of people will start to think that we failed at it, that we didn't do the tightrope walk mm. for some of the characters. I'm pretty sure we did, like as an author, I'm, I'm sure. But it starts with this, you know, uh, I think that the trope is a tortured alpha male cop kind of yeah. character. But the way I think we've handled it is we've, we've tried to make it extremely universal for, yeah. for the, the, the The pain isn't, it's a very universal kind of pain. And as a, as, a, as a role playing game, you can you actually have a lot of choice to define why that person is in that pain. Like slowly, it starts to come up that mm, you may have had a, a very excruciating divorce from your wife. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but you can constantly keep saying that no, no, it's it's because of political reasons. Like you know, right, yeah. I'm trying to restore Revashal to the likeness of the holy sun in the sky, and these immigrants are getting in my way. It's about that. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> so you can try to. Or like you can you can say that you know I'm hurt and broken because you know uh, my radical feminist thing isn't going down well enough. With you. <laughs> it seems like you're trying to avoid something, but you can you can really make it an absurd and and an absurdly personal thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I would say the quality that came across to me was empathy, and I don't just mean that in terms of sympathy between people, but you feel uh, empathy with who you are in the game because mm -hmm. you're so aware of 
all of their doubts inside mm-hmm. internal processes, you know, to an, to an unusual degree. Mm-hmm. But also, part of that is, um, and this is something I maybe haven't seen in you know, many games even attempt, your intuitive sense of what other people are going through. Yeah. Does that make sense? So uh, the, the encounter maybe that I was thinking about uh, was the encounter with the racist truck driver right yeah. outside the, yeah. the bar at the very beginning. Your skills give you like an insight, like they, they speak in your head yeah. about yourself. But they also speak about the other, spe- other people. It's, it's in, in the same kind of empathetic. Yeah, exactly. Level. And so, so even mechanically, it gives you like an insight into people. But this is what cops do, by the way. They yeah. profile. They get in there. They they do. They need to be emp- empathetic because if they're not, it can turn into a dangerous situation for them. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah. Did you like the racist lorry man? Uh, well, I didn't like him. Yeah. But no, the encounter I thought was was kind of like encapsulates a lot of the things mm-hmm. we're talking about. Because I felt that so I like the racist lawyer. Yeah, no, what, a guy, what a guy! Why can't I play as him? No, I didn't want to play as him. What I mean is, like, so I had the experience of playing. I had the experience of playing the game yesterday morning as a hungover white mm-hmm. dude. Mm-hmm. So I was, you know, I, you, you, like I guess I had a, the minimal path of least resistance, mm-hmm. you know, way into that character mm-hmm. so to some extent. No, not forty, but forty. Um, and uh, I thought that conversation was very effective at making me feel anxious about those conversations mm-hmm. in exactly the same way that you were supposed to like the the you had captured the anxiety of being having somebody um att- uh, somebody like uh, a racist or a fascist um look to you as a fellow white person yeah. for sympathy yeah. which is the worst, yeah. worst, worst, worst in front of your partner who's yeah. uh, who's we say samaran but, uh, yeah. <laughs> to uh, any part of the audience asian looking uh, yeah. uh, guy um, and that, that, that kind of that the fact that you have a partner, Kim Gitsuragi, who is uh, who's definitely who de- looks kind of out of place for the setting, even uh, that definitely started bringing up race issues for a game all the time. Yeah, because people do react strangely. Yeah, <laughs> especially towards cops who, who need to uh, constantly, you know, reinforce their authority. I'm interested in so the, this is an interesting thing is that you you have you know this this game is not set in the real world it's, it's analogous to maybe like 1970s mm-hmm. Europe to some extent mm-hmm. but it, it's always going to be to some extent there's, there's, it is uh, you know not Earth it's, necessarily yeah it's not Earth it's it's a kind of well that's like that that's our main cell like that that's our main thing that's what we're doing the world like that's where it kind of comes from I. I don't think it's done before. Like time after time, I've seen that people haven't done it. So some people come and tell me, like China, maybe it's done it. No, no, it's, it's not. That's not yeah. quite it. What we have is it's an it's an hermetic other world, just like like Tolkien or you know yeah. Game of Thrones. Yeah. But it's modern, yeah. and then it has about four thousand years of history behind it. So they've never been in a stasis. They've just it's just another reality that has formed. Mm. But what it allows us to do critically and, and, and with writing and art, it allows us to create this kind of ghost of our world yeah. and then this mirror between those things. And then th- that gives us a certain kind of critical distance. We can, for example, uh, in this world, they don't like to use the word white and black as much as we do, mm. which I think is just a, just very boring language-wise even to use. Yeah. So, so, they, so they use other signifiers, they use Ravasholi and so on. So you can have that kind of fantasy element there to create a certain a bit of distance from our world and play at different kind of world scenarios. Mm. That, that kind of leads us down to pretty polemic ground sometimes, but I hope it also gives us a bit of like, there's a joyous freedom Mm. from time to time that I think people won't appreciate sometimes but in this world there for example never was a big um, slavery thing going on right that may seem I think to some people even unethical to create the fantasy world where it didn't go on but they have had huge problems with classism and other issues and with just mm. massive genocides left and right but they never did that nasty thing and that kind of that really changes the discourse Right. I'm interested in that because you obviously have made a decision to move into your fantasy world, or fantasy world, or your other world. I'd say, I'd say it's a fantasy world. Yeah. Uh, aspects fantasy. of the real, right? Like, you yeah. you know, uh, racism operates, you use, maybe with different terminology, but along a lot of the same recognizable grounds. If you're uh, I playing it as somebody without, you know, who's discovering that background for the first time through that amnesiac main character mm-hmm. and therefore knows really nothing, mm-hmm. um, when I see 
uh, for example, very early on, you see a, like a young black woman underneath a spray mm-hmm. sign that says "fuck the police." Mm-hmm. Oh, it's that's like, such a tense scene. It was horrible. It is difficult, right? But what I'm saying is, in writing that, I am I'm still as player adapting. Like, how much of this is the real world? Yeah. How much of this is a world I'm discovering? Yeah. Um, and I can see uh, parallels to different things, or maybe parallels in other literature. Uh-huh. Um, like. Is that attention that you are aware of and trying to manipulate for effect? I guess is what I'm saying, or is it? It it it, it just happens. We're not like first of all, we definitely don't want to trigger anyone. We're not like yes. tri- <laughs> yeah. we're not we're not trying to shock people in it. It just happens because you have you, you're bringing along. You, you you discover that the scene is I, you, first of all, all of all, you have a, we have a gardener on the corner. Mm-hmm. We decide, okay, um, we, I definitely want it to be, to be black now because but, so was, but everyone in the beginning was just white and have one Asian guy, it's yeah. just getting boring. Like, right. just, you, as a writer, you need we don't have elves and, and yeah. gnomes and I don't know other worthy creatures. Like human beings are so diverse, different, yeah. different, diverse and interesting enough, and and I say, say yeah, yeah, but, you know. It, so it looks cool here, and then you suddenly discover that you have a white cup asking your questions, and it just spirals out of control. Yeah, and you just need to make it. You have to discover that there's a huge tension in there that you're bringing from our world. You may not even know if it's there, and it actually isn't there as much as you think it is. But if you do get strange during that encounter, yeah, our like choice and consequence system really fucks you for a day. Right. I find it really interesting because in this is not a gardener spoiler. Yeah, yeah, I got that impression. <laughs> Um, but what I find interesting is that there's because yeah you come in and, and the strength of you having an amnesiac protagonist which is like you're not the uh, spoilers you're not the first RPG where you wake up with oh, no memory no. right um, but the strength of it which I think is something that would be equivalent to Tall Men in Time Zoom era is the game is not about discovering who you really are in some kind of like objective like yeah. actually you we are don't have flashbacks Vader, right like, we decided we're not going to have flashbacks right because like everyone's seen them already and that's not a good way to talk about it mm-hmm. the way we decided to do this amnesiac thing is that he's in denial like he's something so horribly psychologically strenuous and stressful has happened to this person yes that, that he just doesn't want to like he didn't want to be a human being anymore he didn't want to be this type of animal anymore yeah. it's what he was heard screaming from the other room listening to his sad song and trashing the hotel room so 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 he, he just you can even later twist it this way you can tell your 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 partner in some kind of as you're bleeding out in an action scene you can tell him kill my life I made it all up yeah I remember everything uh, that's yeah that's my really wife left me that's <laughs> <what it is. laughs> so you can spin it in different kind of ways like as a player too. and if, I think the, the first advice is that like I coming at it as me maybe initially and, and possibly doing maybe this is personal how I play these games but initially I sort of try and answer honestly when asked mm-hmm. questions like what do I think like yeah. I'm trying to steer the character but like play through one is yeah. like I'm just going to kind of be Honestly. me yeah. and yeah. then maybe later on I'll try experimenting yeah. and so I come in almost like bringing all of my sort of left wing mm-hmm. 21st century man from Britain kind mm-hmm. of assumptions to that mm-hmm. and I ended up sort of recreating that character to some extent but in a social situation where the dynamics are not exactly what I expect them to be did you become an inexplicable feminist I didn't become an inexplicable feminist because I didn't have that because I accidentally tried to run out on the bar tab oh yeah, oh, yeah. Um, that's the source of fun that is what was fun that, that was um, that is yeah painfully sort of like <laughs> yeah the schadenfreude kind of like but, but I don't know all the shame is the word I'm looking for <laughs> did you flip him off too yeah did you wonder what kind of human being does this yeah, why that, is my character doing this but what it's not your brain that's doing it it's your like body you, yeah. you've trained it to like for some, at some you trained it, to, it yeah, this is the mystery the diving yeah. like John it's Wu, not like yeah, it's not like the mystery isn't in the Thanksgiving torment is why I don't have these mysterious scars mysterious scars I'm yeah. like, here it's like I'm a grown man and I'm yeah. do a, a kimbo flipping off the bartender and, I have, and I'm thinking of telling him to Fuck off, asshole! <laughs> what has happened? To it's, you? it's like, like this other thing. Like, um, I remember talking to the the torment guys back when, and like those games. And I, I actually love those games, but they're based on like often quite like an arch question. Um, uh, Planescape torment was always about like, um, uh, you know, what is it? What 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 makes what is the meaning of a of a, of uh, a man? It's, uh, it was what 
what can change, what can change the, nature the nature of a man, man yeah. and Tyson Numenera what was does life what does one life mean and I <laughs> for my, an hour maybe with Disco Elysium my question was why am I like this which is a question I experience in real life far more often yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why am I like this yeah um, I think actually for me the, the main question I've, I also phrased it I, I love that about Pace Kip Torren yeah. uh, that they had the audacity to, to ask a question and not only they also had the audacity to answer it yes the, the regret was the right answer like, mm. and I, I, I love I love it when stories don't just polemicize that they answer a question. Uh, so so we, all, we also have a question and it's actually uh, what if anything is worth living for? Huh. Right. Uh, and then the answer, I'm going to spoil it for you, is uh, a good job. The job of the police officer that this person is living is the last thing they have. Huh. And that's, that you're solely going to become better at using a skill system and possibly when you get towards the end you can triumph mm. you know you can no one thought you're gonna solve it and you're gonna you can solve it in an absolutely brilliant way bringing together different cases and just like you know Sherlock sort of Holmes beautiful discover if you if you play it nice yeah yeah so so hopefully it's gonna be like this mm. I find that really interesting because games that don't think a lot about the interior lives of their main characters or the consequences of being those characters are often about jobs, right? Yeah. Like you're defined by who you are. Maybe to go back to Diablo, to the extent that, um, up, that Diablo is an RPG, it's a role-playing game where you play the role of basically a pest exterminator. <laughs> right? And you are very, very good at that. You're like the best pest exterminator ever. And you're defined by that. And sure. your growth and the importance of your life, quote unquote, is because you just get better and better and better and better at it. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe it is an RPG. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was being haughty and uh, no, no, no. I, no, think, I think you're right. Just you don't pay like <laughs> that, that. That 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 exterminate never experiences real doubt about their position or yeah. what it's worth or whether yeah. it's what they should be really doing or if they're contributing enough to society. They just do this, right? <laughs> or if they it's should like, be killing literally trillions of sentient beings. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you killed a lot of centaurs and there's no <laughs> like fuck centaurs, man. Exactly. Um, and you know it has no interior life. It has no doubt, right? Like it has no regrets or anything else. And I find it really interesting that, uh, yeah, the, the Torment games um, often come back around to, uh, yeah, a far more, a far more, um, the answer is both also within yourself. It is like, uh -huh. the answer to this is actually something within me. Uh -huh. Whereas you are actually, uh, in arriving at actually the way I engage with society and having a productive thing to do, it's almost like returning to that initial, like, I'm just a really good pest exterminator yeah. but via it, the kind of possible road. Because, it, because I think, I think what it, where it's come from is, is it becomes a metaphor for video game development. Right. Uh, so, which is not an easy job. It is not unstressful. Uh, for me, it's, it's at times tremendously paranoia inducing and then just, uh, it's, it's difficult interfacing with uh, the free market uh, mm. at such an intimate sink or swim survival level. But at the same time, the possibilities in video game development now are just vertiginous, you know. It's like my head is spinning from when we look at our fourth cabinet system, like very not even included in this demo mm. that we have on the show floor. The possibilities in there of getting thoughts and then researching your own dialogue options. Yeah. It's just man, just give me like three years in the computer and I can do things with this that are gonna be yeah. like you know, really, really cool. So, so yeah, it's it's in a way. I just think it's probably come from the yeah, everything's fucked. You know, who am I? Why am I doing this? But at the end, you can just throw aside your you know petty little identity problems and say, I'm I'm probably too far gone, but I'm gonna be a damn good detective. Yeah, and that's a that's just uh, man, that we really have time. But like, that's such an interesting idea politically. That you know, it's actually my kind of uh, my sort of redemption or my kind of self actualization is through labor and what you put into the world is something that can yeah. be easily very much exploited, right? Yeah. That desire is traditionally, historically, yeah. you, you have striking workers in your first area of the game, right? Like this can't be something that's... Yeah, 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 sure. I mean, we are, I mean, first, well, we ourselves are shockingly left-wing people, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the game isn't. Like, mm. I mean, I even sometimes think that I maybe have gone too far in the opposite direction, yeah. and, and you don't get to meet the real communist or an actual kind of in any way credible labor person for a long time in the game and then if you get when you get to the striking workers their union boss so to say you're like yeah they call him union boss even that sounds really bad but this is actually the union representative or uh, elected official <laughs> it's uh it's you gotta love that guy it's the most corrupt human being you've ever seen 
but he's cool. Like I didn't want him to. I wanted the rich guy, the girl who's mm. coming there. I wanted her to be the most sympathetic person I've ever seen. She's wonderful, very well worded. She has the luxury of not being a corrupt individual. The strike negotiator, you know, from right. the from the from the company. And the union boss is just the worst sly, slimy limey you've ever seen. Does that make him wrong? So, so I think, yeah, I think, although it's very politically charged, I think it's. It, 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 it's we've gone pretty far into uh, into into playing with that, but in the end, towards the end, there are some characters that we've also built who are very very left wing and who convincingly do yeah. it. I don't want to spoil a lot, but uh, the the main essence of the setting is that they tried a revolution 52 years ago, a massive social revolution that also always almost turned into a world revolution, and then was just wiped out, and it's been a just a free market experimental zone for 42 years after right. divided under foreign powers. Uh, so left-wing things are doing really bad in that world, as they are in our world, I believe, uh, are really on, on the retreat. And, and, and the, I think of a past like disco, sort of, yeah. like disco. <laughs> yeah, huh. I was going to ask about that because maybe this is an interesting thing to wrap up on, because you renamed the game to Disco Elysium. Yeah. Um, Disco it sort of has a little role to play at the very beginning of the game because it's like you know where it sits alongside you know, the loud disco music was coming from your apartment in yeah. your, your three day fugue state or whatever that was. Yeah. What is the significance of disco? Why disco? What we can do, main, the main, I think, perhaps even the most exciting thing that we can do in this setting is that we can do music. We right. can do real culture thing. It sounds so funny to have disco in another world. And then mm. later on, we have like <laughs> rap. Rap music is called Sprechgesanging. Right. <laughs> As a, a ni late nineteenth century word for sing song <laughs> technique in, in Germany, <laughs> which is what what you expect rap music to be called. But at the same time, we can have like we can put we can give rock music back to black people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we can do weird. You know, <laughs> we can do some real social justice there. So so we, so we can actually play with culture in the world. Mm. So other worlds usually don't have culture. They're not that people, you know, go on about, about they're not having economy and so on. I think they have some economy, but they have no culture. And that's human beings don't just you know, do wars. Mostly they do stupid pop culture like things in the modern setting. Yeah. So yeah, this goes definitely one of it. This goes different in that world. It's also a kind of furthest gilded era thing. Right. And it's also an analog for so neoliberalism sweet. in the nineties and print right. and stuff. And yeah. that's now just dead and, and festering in the world, just like you know <laughs> <laughs> So it's also it's also this kind of opulent uh, opulent kind of like cocaine fuel kind of thing. Sounds like video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, partially, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, it, but also, I, I mean, I, I'm completely veering off course here, but there's something I've discovered about disco while calling it disco. It's called Disco Elysium because Elysium is the name of the setting. Mm -hmm. And then this, I, I just believe it's my birthright to call it that. And that's just wanted to call that when I was 17 and wanted yeah. to back up because well, I yeah. knew Blanc up called something. something. <laughs> I also wanted to own, it, own that. But I've, I've discovered things about disco. First of all, I've discovered that people's um, pre. Um, Conceived weird notions about disco are tremendously homophobic. Yeah, like I mean, li we literally got people saying, "Oh, no truth to the mirrors, it was such a such a metal name, man. Disco's gay." <laughs> like, I think people that, that should that should galvanize you on that yeah. name, right? <laughs> really, really did galvanize me. But at the same time, it's a sparkling kind of funny, slightly stupid name. I didn't want. I had a problem with the darkness of the name. No truth yeah. to the mirrors. Uh, and, and at the same time, disco was like the first time when black people were actually let into mass global culture and that they actually really achieved mass uh, acclaim. Yeah. So uh, I think there was also some, you know, there was also a definite strike, you know, theme of racism in the kind of anti-disco thing. Yeah. So <laughs> by calling my name Disco Elysium, I've gotten some of that fucking disco hatred on me. Right, <laughs> that's true. Like, because like, so <laughs> the, both Nutris the Furies and, El and Elysium gesture to Again, Western mythology, yeah, right, Greek, Western, Western, yeah. yeah, Greek myth, the roots of Western mythology. So having disco in there gives you that American kind American, of pop culture, American but also non-white, like. which we which we also are. We're we're very ha 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 pop culture, ha ha ha. Like we're not ironic. Like we don't, yeah. we don't, we don't, we're not. I, I haven't yet lived in Camden Town, but we don't, we don't do that kind of yeah. thing. Uh, but it is, it does have like. It doesn't have like four four breaking pop culture reference ha, ha, yeah, ha, yeah. shit in there, but it's very knowledgeable of how culture works and then how things become fads and how this main character, you know, him being very much past his prime is it's just for our world the best way to 
uh, symbolize that using culture is by calling him the disco has been. It's just funny. It just turns yeah, into this yeah. funny kind of cool thing. But in the end, like I mean, why should you be a disco has been? Why can't you just be like a proud you know, disco has? Bottom? Disco has, yeah. yeah. The disco be. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. And then later in the game, there's this, uh, there's a, there's a really cool sequence there where we buried huge amounts of production time, and I thought I was going to insane that I'm doing it. But you can start a nightclub in a church. Okay. It's a very strange thing yeah. to do. And you can Lots start a nightclub there, and you can meet these youths who are listening to music that sounds like rave, but they're not calling it rave, they're calling it anodic music. Nice. So they have this really 50s style, but slightly ravish music going on. And you can help them you know, establish a new nightclub and call it Disco Elysium, and that kind of get a, get a bit of, uh, uh, disco redemption going on, <laughs> and and also you can uh, you can uh, you can dance. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a, you have a skill check to dance, and you can dance in an absolutely absolutely insane and unexpected way. <laughs> Thanks for listening. As ever, all of our Crate and Crowbar stuff is supported by our Patreon, which you can find at patreon.com forward slash Crate and Crowbar. You should check back tomorrow where I'll be posting another one of these sort of ch- sit down chats at Res, in which I'll be talking to Lottie Bevan and Alexis Kennedy from Weather Factory about Cultist Simulator. See you then. Bye bye.